Hey everybody, welcome to another video, and today we're going to be taking a look at Rocket Lab's latest earnings report for the third quarter this year. Before we get into this, I'd like to take a look at the stock first. Um, as we can see here, these earnings came out on November 9th, uh, and the very next day, uh, you can see that the stock shot up quite a bit. But if you take a look over at the S&P 500, for example, we can see that this is pretty much what the broad market did. Um, and this isn't necessarily very specific to Rocket Lab's earnings. Um, of course, those earnings probably did help them, but um, just keep in mind that this wasn't necessarily entirely caused by these latest earnings. This, this was a move that happened across the board for pretty much all stocks. Now getting into the slide presentation, we can see that Rocket Lab had three successful launches here in the third quarter. They had successful missions for repeat customers, which included the National Reconnaissance Office and Sinspective. And some of these major milestones they passed here in the third quarter was the 30th Electron launch, the 300th Rutherford engine in space, and the 150th satellite that they've deployed so far up until the end of the third quarter. Another major milestone that Rocket Lab achieved was a successful hot fire of a pre-flown Rutherford engine. This is very significant because Rocket Lab is, of course, targeting electron reusability by catching that booster with a helicopter. So this is a very significant milestone, especially considering that this engine was from an ocean recovery rather than a mid-air dry recovery. Rocket Lab fired the refurbished engine for 200 seconds with multiple restarts, and it ended up performing to the same standard as a newly built one. And then they have a slide on their responsive space program where if a satellite fails through accidental or deliberate actions, Rocket Lab is able to rapidly replace or establish new assets on orbit, which is crucial for both government and commercial operators. Then we have an overview of the Archimedes engine test facility, which is located at the Stennis Space Center. This is where they're going to be testing out the new Archimedes engine that they're developing for their neutron rocket. And they say they're pursuing capital investment from the Mississippi Development Authority to further develop facilities and infrastructure for the Archimedes engine. Now here's a look at Archimedes. It's going to be using an oxidizer-rich closed engine cycle, which is going to be optimized for reliability and reuse. And because this engine is optimized for reusability, Rocket Lab won't be pushing the engine to its limits, which will avoid some of the biggest problems that others have had when using this type of engine design. Then down here they say that they have full-scale prototype hardware being developed, including Archimedes engine and neutron tank structures. And with the production tooling being completed, the vehicle design is locked in and parts can be made quickly to speed up that development timeline. And here's a look at some of the automated manufacturing techniques that Rocket Lab will be using to manufacture neutron tank structures. They've been using this automated manufacturing method with Electron where they've had a lot of success so far. Then they've got an overview on the neutron production complex that they've been building over in Virginia, and they say that the first neutron stage 1 tank structure will be built at the site in quarter 1 next year. Then there's this announcement for a major contract that Rocket Lab has won totaling $14 million to provide Lockheed Martin and one other undisclosed customer for the U.S. Department of Defense's next-gen Tranche 1 tracking, tracking layer constellation. This deal, again, totals $14 million, and it's going to be using Rocket Lab's motorized light band separators, um, which have a 100% mission success rate, which is probably part of the reason why they've won this contract. They've also won a contract to supply solar panels to Lockheed Martin for three large missile warning satellites for the U.S. Space Force, and this continues the long-standing Solero support for missile warning satellites for the U.S. Space Force. Solero, of course, is now a part of Rocket Lab. And then we have a big accomplishment for Rocket Lab here, where they've successfully transferred data between two satellites 110 kilometers apart as part of DARPA and SDA's concept for future satellite constellations that communicate at the speed of light. And as a demonstration of Rocket Lab's vertical integration here, we can see that flight software, mission operations, star trackers, reaction wheels, and separation systems were all provided by Rocket Lab for this Mandrake 2 mission. Rocket Lab has also signed an agreement with the U.S. Transportation Command to explore uses of neutron, electron, and photon for cargo transportation, on-orbit depots, and point-to-point -point travel. Rocket Lab also completed their high-volume production line for reaction wheels, which they're going to be using to deliver a bunch of reaction wheels to an unannounced customer um, in quarter one next year. And this production line is going to be capable of delivering up to 2,000 reaction wheels per year. And the first launch from the U.S. has now been scheduled, where they'll be launching the Hawkeye 360 mission from Launch Complex 2 in Virginia. 
And on top of that, the second mission from Launch Complex 2 has also been signed, which they plan to launch in January next year. And they say that across both of their launch complexes, they'll be able to launch more than 130 launches per year. Rocket Lab will also be providing a satellite operations control center for Global Star's growing constellation, and this will serve Global Star's existing satellites as well as the 17 new satellites that Rocket Lab is going to be building for Global Star. And in another demonstration of Rocket Lab's vertical integration, we can see all of these things that Rocket Lab is going to be providing to Global Star for their constellation, including that 24 7 Global Satellite Operations Control Center, as we went over up here, and as well as solar panels, which includes 2.7 kilowatts per satellite. Um, they're going to be providing radios for Global Star and their MAX flight software on all 17 of the spacecraft that they're going to be launching for them. Um, there's going to be Rocket Lab internally built power distribution systems, and there's going to be the option to increase value with launch dispensers. Rocket Lab will also be providing solar panels to NASA JPL for use on the Cadre robots, which they'll be using to explore the moon and distant planets. Then moving on to the financials here, we can see that Rocket Lab brought in $63.1 million of revenue, which was 14% quarter over quarter revenue growth. And Rocket Lab's gross margins improved quarter over quarter on both a gap and non-gap basis. And as we can see here, Rocket Lab's space systems business is currently making up much more of their revenue than their launch business. Now here we sort of have the same information, but on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, so instead of having quarter 2, 2022, um, this is now quarter 3, 2021. And as we can see, the growth looks much more significant here on the year-over-year -year basis. And this is driven almost entirely by these recent acquisitions that Rocket Lab has made, where um, today they have all of this revenue coming in from these new companies, whereas a year ago they didn't have that. So this growth is not something that's going to stick around. Um, this is something that's kind of a temporary thing. And going forward, you know, like a year from now, this growth in their space systems business probably won't be as dramatic as what we're seeing here today. Then here we can see Rocket Lab's operating expenses on both a gap and non-gap basis, broken up by R&D in red, and their selling general and administrative expenses here in black. They say that their gap selling general and administrative expense increased $4 million, which was mostly driven by deal-related amortization of intangibles and a change in the fair value of contingent considerations related to the acquisition of PSC. And they say that their gap research and development expense slightly decreased, mostly because of lower amortization of purchased intangibles and reduced stock-based compensation. And then on a non-gap basis, they say that their SG&A expense increase was mostly driven by staff costs, travel, and higher marketing costs. And then as for the research and development increase, they say it was mostly driven by neutron and photon staffing, as well as materials, tools, and equipment. And then Rocket Lab has provided fourth quarter guidance of between 51 and 54 million dollars of total revenue. And then of that total revenue, they're guiding for between 34 and 37 million dollars of it to come from their space systems business. And then from the three launches they're planning to have here in quarter four, they're expecting that remaining 17 million dollars to come from that launch services business. And then they're expecting between 5 and 7% of gap gross margin for the fourth quarter, lower than what they reported here in quarter three. And they say it's due to a lower margin product mix within their space system segment and a lower absorption cost of overhead expenses in the launch service segment. However, they do expect non-gap gross margin to be between 16 and 18 percent. And then Rocket Lab is guiding for between 39 million and 41 million dollars of gap operating expenses for the fourth quarter, which is pretty much exactly the same as it is here in quarter three. And then they do expect non-GAAP operating expenses to fall in between $28 and $30 million. And then they're guiding for interest expense of $1 million, adjusted EBITDA loss of $12 to $16 million, and basic shares outstanding, totaling 474 million shares. Taking a look at the third quarter balance sheet here, we can see Rocket Lab has $333 million of cash at the moment, which is substantially lower than the $542 million of cash they had back in quarter two. Um, but if you take a look here, um, here in quarter three, they now have a lot of marketable securities, which they didn't have any back in quarter two. So in addition to paying off their expenses, these marketable securities is where the bulk of that cash has gone. 
Now taking a look at the stock, we can see that it did spike the day after the earnings came out. But of course, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, uh, this is pretty much just following the macroeconomic environment. So unfortunately, we can't really see what the exact reaction was to these earnings because it was just mixed in with this macroeconomic trend. At the moment, Rocket Lab is trading for $5.64 per share at a $2.7 billion valuation. I am a shareholder of Rocket Lab, and I believe the stock still has a lot of upside, even though we are above some of the lows we've seen earlier this year. I have some other videos on Rocket Lab, so make sure to check those out, and I'll see all of you in the next video.